I think we generally have a romanticized view of farming in this country. Not that it's easy or unsophisticated by any means, but that farming only involves planting crops, raising livestock, harvesting fields, getting your crops or animals to market, and making your kids do their chores before and after school. The seasons change, but the process repeats, right? Hardly. 96% of U.S. farms are family-owned and 75% are multi-generational, but they employ people who are not relatives, they contract with other businesses, they manage complex assets, investments, and debts, and they deal with government regulations that often hinder, not help. Yes, there are large agricultural conglomerates in the industry, but the day-to-day operation of an individual or family-owned farm poses a similar range of business and legal challenges and risks. There are any number of attorneys they can call for legal advice on specific aspects of farming. But wouldn't you want a lawyer, a sticky lawyer, who not only talks the talk, but also walks the walk and farms the farm? Joining me today is John Schwartz, the farm lawyer. No joke, his web address is thefarmlawyer.com. But that's not spin. He truly is a farmer who practices law while running a family farm in Cass County, Indiana, where he raises corn, wheat, and soybeans. He's active with his children's 4-H livestock projects and experiences the same successes and struggles as the clients he counsels. I'm excited to talk with John and learn a lot more. John, I'm honored to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. My first question is, what does an average day look like for you? I, I know that changes from season to season, but how do you balance the demands of your two professions and your other job as a father? Well, I think a lot of it is, um, uh, you know, I'm not a livestock farmer. You know, I don't have 80 head of cattle running around out there. We have, you know, what I'll call 4-H animals and pets as far as, you know, quote, livestock. Growing up, I watched my neighbors milk cows. My one neighbor said he felt like he was in jail for 42 years during that time of milking cows. And so the balance is, um, it's a little easier with being a row crop farmer. You know, you're going to have some busy times of the year, you know, naturally spring planting season, fall harvest season. I would like to say there was a downtime with farming now, but there really isn't. Um, During the winter months, you know, you're repairing machinery, kind of getting an idea on what you're going to plant the next year, so on and so forth. So it's not always easy, but I got some really good help here at the law office. That makes a big difference. And um, those times where I need to be out of here to do, you know, spring planting, fall harvest, I'm able to do that. So like anybody else, you know, you you try to find balance and and maybe uh, I'm still trying to find balance fully (laughs) at the end of the day. Is it a scheduling challenge? Do you say X number of hours per day or per week are going to be in the law office and then there's the demands of the farm and the number of hours that takes? How do you balance those two totally different and disparate vocations? Yeah, I mean, so as an attorney, a lot of other people run your life and your schedule, okay? Judges, you know, the court schedule, you know, the needs of the clients. And so I I try to do the lawyering during the day and sometimes on the weekends too, and then separate that from the farming uh, to where it's weekends uh, and, and evenings. That way, the farm's not cutting into you know, what I have to do at the law office. You know, let's face it, a certain part of a day after a guy's been in an office for 9, 10, maybe 11 hours, you want to go home and do something different. And I find the farming is kind of therapeutic mm. because you're out there. Uh, it's just it's a really change of pace of being in the office. And the busy season, uh, like I have no idea when I'll be planning next year. So I pick a, a week and I'm just, I just tell the office staff, block me out for that week. And if it works where I'm going to be planning, great. If not, then we'll move some things around when we get there in case that week's wet or the, you know, the weather hasn't changed yet and so on and so forth. So I try to keep them separate. I try not to, you know, take half days unless I have to. And, and that way I just like get done what I have here at the office, go home, and then work on the farm. Describe farm law for us and 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 maybe amongst the things that that entails maybe it it would be easier to say what you do and what you don't do yeah i would say you know farm ag law i would say there's some areas that i do that are very specific to farms and i would consider farm and ag law Uh, one of those areas would be issues that arise with farmers uh, with the usda farm service agency Uh, The Farm Service Agency is a subset of the USDA. 
They administer the program payments, uh, the various programs that farmers enroll in. And if you're going to receive government money through those programs, you have to, in a sense, you know, follow the rules, uh, especially when it comes to wetlands. If you're a farmer, you cannot go out and tile a wetland, convert a wetland. You will be ineligible for government payments, government programs. And so to me, I think that's a very specific area that I would call ag law, even though it's dealing with wetlands. Mm -hmm. The USDA and the Farm Service Agency, it's just a whole different set of rules, you know. And so I call that ag law. Uh, grain contracts, you know, I mean, pretty much every elevator, grain elevator that a farmer sells to is going to have that farmer enter into a grain contract. Um, those are very specific rules. Um, most of the time coming from the National Grain and Feed Association, which is a trade group um, out of Washington, D.C., and uh, elevators join that trade group and that way their contracts, any disputes, uh, it's the rules of the NGFA and the arbitration. If there's a dispute, they, they govern those contract disputes. And so I think that's a real uh, an area I would call ag law. Um, you start getting into areas such as like estate planning, contracts, real estate, you know, a lot of what I do, I mean, I call it ag law, but it's regular law just in a farm setting. But farming is such a unique business that I find that, yeah, it may be estate planning, let's say, let's just use estate planning, mm -hmm. but it's totally different than what you would be doing for a non-farmer um, or, you know, contracts you know the contracts are going to cover everything from you know solar leases to grain growing agreements to cash rents i mean on and on and on and so i i usually tell people yes there's several areas that i do that are specific to you know that i call ag law because that's really our ag law and most of what i do is regular law but in a farm setting and who are your clients exclusively farmers are they also companies that are in the the industry how do you define your client roster 95 percent of my clients are farmers i made the decision a long time ago that in my mind you either represent the farmer side of the fence or you represent the you know farm kind of business side of the fence and I went with the farm side of the fence for the farmers. There are some businesses that are clients of mine, but by and large, 95% of my people are just like me, family farmers. Is the decision to have that 95% focus on farmers, is that credibility? Is that just uh, clarity in your mind as to who you're representing? Uh, would it be detrimental to your practice if you're Farmer clients knew that you were also working with other players that may have different interests? It could. You know, I mean, I, I really don't want to be on the side of, because I, I do a lot of litigation, and I don't want to be on a side of basically suing another farmer, if I can avoid that. I want to be known as, you know, like you said earlier, you know, the farm lawyer. I want to be the lawyer for farmers. We've had a tremendous amount of consolidation in the ag business over the last couple of years, you know, who would have thought that Monsanto would be bought out? Mm -hmm. You know, I could go on and on. And those companies are, the consolidation is not good for the American farmer. I don't care what anybody says. And I want to represent the family farms. You know, there's, there's still around 2 million farmers in this country, you know, family farms. And I want to see that number stay strong. And I've just never, you know, like I said, I just decided to pick the uh, two horses I could ride and felt like trying to straddle both of them wasn't going to be a good idea or easily done. So I've just picked the farm side. And, and a lot of it's just because I know what I go through on my farm. I've been in lawsuits with my farm before. And you farm long enough nowadays, I tell guys, you're going to have a lawsuit at some point. You know, it's just cost doing business. And I think with me, not only probably have going through what the client's going through, but also with the farm knowledge, I think that's extremely helpful and reassuring to a client. In the introduction, I, I referenced statistics about family-owned, multi-generational farms. Did you grow up on a farming family, and, and which generation are you? 
I'm third. I'm a third generation farmer. Tell us about growing up on the family farm, what you learned, and, and I guess transitioning to what your career path was, if it wasn't going to be farming at first, if it was, you know, when you decided on law. My dad's originally from Germany. They immigrated over to uh, New Jersey because uh, some other family was there. They had a, a vegetable farm out in New Jersey. And then my, my dad came to Indiana to be uh, an engineering student because the engineering schools were too expensive out east. Hmm. And I uh, met my mom, nice Italian gal from Fort Wayne, Indiana. And they had a, uh, a farm uh, up in, quote, the country, as they called it. And so my dad, uh, he was an engineer at International Harvester in Fort Wayne designing the trucks. And there was a farmer that was retiring and dad kind of befriended him and ended up buying his equipment and just started farming. And growing up, I mean, we're not like, you know, I have clients that are six, seven generational farms. Sure. You know, my dad started out with nothing and was able to build it up from there. Uh, dad was always an engineer. You know, the farm wasn't big enough to support the family. So dad would uh, go, be, go be an engineer. And he always, you know, the term is a flashlight farmer. Uh, you come home at night, you farm by the flashlight. And growing up, I, I don't know, it looked like a good gig to me. I mean, you went <laughs> and you, I liked how things worked and uh, I liked farming. And so I went to uh, engineering school and I graduated with an engineering degree. My first job, I lasted a year because the stock market tanked in 2000. And um, I was working for an automotive company, automotive industries up and down. So I was out of a job, laid off in 2000, went to another place, September 11th rolled around, 2001. I was out of a job there. And finally, I said, you know, told myself, self, I uh, watched my dad go through about 16 jobs over his career. You know, not getting fired, just laid off, you know, just, just mm -hmm. uh, moving around and all that. And I wanted something a little bit more stable. And I ended up meeting a patent attorney who basically said I should go to law school because uh, patent attorneys in demand. He's like, do you like to argue? Yeah, kind of. I'm about much as anybody. Do you like how things work? Yeah. Well, yeah, be a patent attorney, John. Go get a law degree. Team that up with your mechanical engineering degree. We can make, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. And I thought, okay. So I went to law school, I uh, left my uh, engineering job the where I was at, and I did some patent work. I did an internship between the first semester and second semester of law school for a couple of weeks. I came away from the conclusion that if you liked reading your dishwasher manual, mm -hmm. you'd love patent law. Mm. So I was like, there's no way I can do this. I can't sit and read just boring stuff all day long. Sorry. So I don't know what I'm doing. And I go to law school and go back to the second semester. And I ended up, uh, I was going to Valparaiso at the time. And I, I ended up being a, a finishing high enough in the class that I was able to go to Indiana University for, it was a higher ranked law school and I, I'd always wanted to go there. So I transferred there. And it's kind of one of those aha moments in life I'm sitting there one day and one of my classmates, and they all knew I was a farmer. They come up and they're like, hey, John, you've been down the career center lately? I'm like, no. And they're like, they've got this posting for a summer job. It's some ag farm. I don't know what it is. He goes, but I saw a farm and thought of you. I said, okay, well, I better get my rear end down there and take a look because I don't have any job for the summer. Well, it was Indiana Farm Bureau, and uh, they were looking for a legal intern to basically work uh, alongside their ag policy department. And uh, also at that time, they were um, experiencing a high level of ag tourism starting out. This was 2003. Mm -hmm. And before, you know, people weren't coming out to farms. <laughs> you know, the general public didn't come out en masse to somebody's farm. Yeah. Now, not only are they, you know, now they're being invited and paying to come out on people's farm for you pick pumpkin patches. You know, I, I saw a cow renting operation where you could rent a cow and you supposedly got that milk from that specific, you know, cow number 675, you know, whatever. Go play baseball on the farm. Thank you, Kevin Costner. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All these things, you know. So as an insurance company, you can imagine they were like, whoa, okay. So I got to go all around the state and see different farms and all that and the common response I got was, you're a law student. How do you know so much about farming? Hmm. Well, I've been farming a hell of a lot longer. I've been a law student. And I could see at that point that there was a need. You know, I could see you needed somebody that could speak the language of farmers. Most people don't like attorneys. Farmers 
like attorneys even less hmm. for various reasons. They'll use attorneys, but and much more now. But you know, people see the attorneys on the TV and the billboards, and they think that's what everybody does. Hmm. Okay. But anyway, so that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to make a run at this ag law. And I was at a law firm that it took me a year to convince them that ag law was a viable option. And so I lasted about six years working for other people before I said enough, I'm starting my own law practice because I could see where it was going to go. And that's what I did in 2011. I opened my own practice and never looked back. So going back, you were assisting your dad, helping your dad on the farm throughout college and law school as well. I mean, you, you didn't stop yes. farming. No. That first job out of law school, what kind of law firm was that? And, and what were you doing that you had to convince them that ag law was something they could also add to the mix? It was, a, I won't call it a bigger firm. It was about 20 attorneys and it was based out of a larger city. And I worked at in one of their satellite offices and they mostly did municipal law and, and um, mostly towns and cities and all that, you know, government work. And, you know, I, I just, it was in my home area. So a lot of the farmers knew me and started calling for me, you know, with different issues and that. And I uh, try to, uh, you know, I, I talk to the, the powers that be and they're like, well, you know, we don't know about ag law and we don't know if it'd be viable and blah, blah. And the firm's never done that. And so I finally harassed them enough. They let me have a seminar. I'll never forget this. So I have this seminar, free seminar for farmers. And I bet a hundred people come out. Now, the firm in Fort Wayne would have a Medicaid seminar. And if they got like eight people, that was a big deal. Hmm. Okay. So I had a hundred come out and they were just like, oh my gosh, we can't believe this, you know? And still, it was just, when you're in a bigger firm, I remember I, I changed my name on my email, okay? I changed my, uh, what do you call it, signature block, okay? You know, to put basically that I, you know, John Schwartz, turning at law, farm ag law on this, oh, that was a huge deal. That was, you know, I mean, that got a call from the main office <laughs> that I had changed my signature block, okay, to include ag law. And they actually had the computer guy change, make sure all of ours were the exact same and lock out where you could never change that again. So I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I'm betting these guys are going to want me, uh, let me advertise and do the things that I want to do yeah. after that. So you want to be able to control your own destiny. And that's when I said, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go out on my own. Uh, and that's what I did. You know, there's a, I will say there's a pattern that I see personally outside of the practice as well. And it's not universal. It's certainly true for me. We see our parents and how they work, their work environment, whether that's nine to five in an office in a cubicle or calling their own shots as a, a business owner. And again, a pattern. We tend to gravitate towards that. It's what we know. It makes sense. It's where we grew up. I would imagine you as a business owner, owner of two businesses, probably your, your worst day as a business owner is better than your best day as somebody else's employee. Is that true? I would say so. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's always challenging having your own business. But, you know, Bill Parcells said one time, if they're going to make you cook the meal, they ought to let you pick out the groceries at least. That always stuck with me. He said that when he was coaching the Patriots. And I always felt like, you know, if they want you, you know, because these, these firms also want set number of billable hours, you know, they, they put a billable hour requirement on you as a young associate. They put a dollar amount requirement on you as associate. And, you know, I didn't go to law school to, you know, and want to do ag law to have like a billable hour goal. You mm -hmm. know, I wanted to help people. And the bigger firms, you know, I, in my opinion, I think it's money driven. And if they want these expectations from you, well, they ought to let you pick out the groceries, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And how, how are you going to advertise? How are you going to? Like one of the things I did was I started writing in some farm magazines. I'd gotten farm magazines from a kid, you know, and I'm kind of on the cusp of that generation where, I mean, I can do everything on the computer. But when it comes to farm magazines, I just like the feel of a farm magazine. I like the glossiness. I like flipping through the pages. I like the pictures. And, you know, the average age of the farmer is 64 in this country. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's still a lot of people read these farm magazines. And I always noticed I never saw anything legal in here. Nothing. You can put all sorts of articles about cover crop and this and that. And so one of the things I started doing, I just said, hey, can I submit some articles? And that's what really, I think, helped get me started was just putting some articles out there. And 
I still do it today. I write for several uh, farm magazines. And if people call me, great. If they don't, that's fine, too, because I think I'm doing a service to the farm community. You know, if some if one person reads my article and it makes a difference and saves the farm, that's worth it to me. I can tell you from experience that you are above average when it comes to thinking about promoting your practice, marketing your practice. And when you tell stories about signature block issues and seeing the need to contribute articles where there are none in particular publications, that's pretty forward thinking. Do you fancy yourself as having kind of a marketing mindset or was it kind of epiphanies along the way that, hey, this seems to make sense, I should do this? Marketing has always fascinated me. Okay. How do I get you two to buy this mouse? Okay. How do I convince you that this mouse is the mouse you need? By the way, for anybody listening, it's a computer mouse. It's not a real mouse. Right. Just want to make sure. Theater of the mind here. <laughs> yes. And it's a vertical mouse. It's not a regular mouse because my wrist, I couldn't, I was losing, I was getting carpal tunnel. So I had to get this vertical mouse. Maybe that's a bad analogy. I don't know. But no, marketing has always fascinated me because it's like, how do you get people to do things that, to get an understanding of what you're doing, what you're selling, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always been fascinated by that. But I think I'm also, I just, I, I just got a part of my mind that does that. Uh, I just, you know, like the, the articles, doing the seminars, doing the things that I do. Um, I just, I enjoy that. I enjoy saying, what can I do to get my message out there? Because at the end of the day, an informed clientele is a better clientele for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the more good information you can get out there, especially farmers reading farm magazines, the better that's going to help farm communities and help the farm profession as a whole. This may be form over substance, but I'm, I'm curious about something. We, we, we generate a lot of content for our clients, and it can come from a client saying, hey, we've just run into this issue and we think we should write about it. Or it can come from, we think with our intended audience, they should know these things. When you're coming up with ideas for articles, what's the impetus? What's the spark of creativity for the topics that you write on? Well, I tell people that every stupid thing you could do on your farm over the years, that you would need an attorney or would get you into something, we did, okay? Wetland violation, been there. Grain storage issue with the FSA, been there. Boundary dispute with the joining property owner, been there. Okay, I, I could keep going. Okay, it's just, it's just, um, and I'll throw my dad under the bus a little bit. Love dad, but my dad's full German, okay? And so there's an old adage, you can always tell a German, but you can't tell him much, okay? That's my dad, all right? And I can say that because I'm half German, but I mean, it's just, there's an inherent stubbornness and that kind of uh, got us in some situations over the years. And so a lot of times I just write about my experience because I can talk about it and those experiences and, and which I still have too, right? I mean, I'd like to think I'm not doing stupid things anymore, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing things on my farm. Okay. So for instance, if, if there's a government program coming out or if, you know, I'm seeing that, uh, you know, something else has happened on the farm, I'll write about that. But also in the law, too. So, I, so I'm, I'm getting that material. I've got two streams that are putting that material in. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it is, you know, I want people to be able to protect themselves, too. And so I, I harp a lot on getting the farm set up with the right structure and using LLCs and those things. So I'd like to think multiple sources. At the end of the day, that I guess I would boil down to what I see on my farm what I see in the law practice, and what I see just in general. Sure. Going to Valparaiso and then Indiana for law school, are they known for having agricultural law curriculum, and did you take advantage of, of those? None whatsoever. There's one law school I know, well, the, probably one of the more uh, ag-oriented law schools is Drake in Iowa. Okay. The only class I took at Indiana University was water law. Right? And that dealt with a bunch of uh, all the cases out West. But I never forget, Professor Fishman told me, he said, you know, John, you're smart for taking this class. And I said, why? He said, because you'll be doing water law in Indiana in the years to come when water gets more of an issue. And it's starting to get there. Go Professor Fishman for being so prescient. Yeah, he was right dead on at the time. I thought, we're in the Great Lakes region. <laughs> we don't have a water problem, you know. It's starting. Your father 
a businessman. And by the way, I feel like we're going to have to apologize to all IP attorneys and all Germans by the time we get to the end of this this episode. But uh, uh, nevertheless, oh, I'm, I'm not I'm not done offending people. <laughs> That's what I say. We, we may add to the list. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. Your father, obviously a businessman by owning a farm. Did he encounter the issues that your clients are facing? I know he did. Did you assist him with those things? Did you have that kind of firsthand before you thought you would be a lawyer experience? Well, I mean, the one wetland violation that we had, yes. I remember uh, helping him. Uh, I was in high school. That wasn't really our fault. I call it a violation. But what had happened is there was a county ditch that went through a farm, one of our farms. And every so many years, they have to come in and dip out this ditch because it goes through a, a muck ground that's very fluffy and the critters, you know, dig in the ditch banks and it, it just, it fills in the, it fills in the ditch. Okay. Well, the county supposedly, even though they collect the ditch tax uh, in Indiana, didn't have enough money to dip that ditch out. So the ditch was not working and it backed up. We had a clay tile uh, that was uh going into that ditch and it backed up the water in that tile and it blew it up. The pressure got enough where it blew it up. That made about a two acre area that you just couldn't farm. The USDA has a rule that says if you don't farm something, Indiana was almost all wetland, okay? So just about everything you farm is what's called a, a prior converted wetland. Yes, it was wetland long ago, but now it's been converted. If you don't farm it, it's considered being abandoned. It can revert back to a wetland, okay? Well, this thing with the county went on for years and years. Well, finally, they got the enough funds and were able to dip the creek. And then, you know, we go to put new tile in it. Oh, no, you can't do that, says USDA. That's a, that's a wetland. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. We farmed it five or six years ago. You know, And so that's where I really first got into looking at, uh, and it didn't dawn on me at the time. I was just too young, you know. But that's the first kind of legal issue as a non-attorney I helped out on. And I, and I learned a lot, uh, you know, just from that process, you know, going to the FSA, there's a FSA in about every county and every state you go there, there's a local board you go in front of. And then if you don't get what, you know, what you're seeking there, you go to the state level and then you go to the national level. So there's quite a few appeal process in the Farm Service Agency world. But yeah, that was my first experience. And then, you know, when I became an attorney after that, then obviously it was a lot more helpful to deal with some of the issues that we were having. And when did you become your own farm owner? Age 19. Tell me about that. Well, we farmed for some people that um, I had just graduated uh, high school and was going to college and we had farmed for some people for a long time. And um, they had a, a, it wasn't a lot of acres, 24 acres. Uh, they had moved from Chicago to the country. Um, it was a family home and they were having some health issues. We're going to move back to Chicago and wanted to know if I wanted to buy the farm. And they were kind enough to sell it to me on a land contract because, you know, 19 year old kid, you're not going to walk down to the bank and get you know, a loan. And so we did it over a 10 year uh, land contract. And how has your farm or your business grown since you were 19? Well, it's actually shrank. When I came back from law school, we farmed about 530 acres. We took the farm to 4,000 acres in a short amount of time. And getting help, like anywhere now, you know, it's, it's hard to get help, the labor market. It's been hard on a farm for a long time. You know, before the last couple of years when we've had this labor shortage, you know, we've been experiencing it in the farm communities for a long time. And especially up in the, the area that I was in, it's close to Elkhart County, Indiana, the trailer capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And guys there can go in the trailer factories and make 80 grand a year and be home by noon because a lot of the Amish work there and they want to be home early. So they start really early. Uh, you can come work for me and on, on a farm or you know whatever and make, let's say, 40000 and sometimes be out till midnight. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so labor was always tough. You know, my dad was getting older. Uh, my dad was getting in the farm accidents. Uh, I had no doubt my dad was going to get killed out in a farm accident. And um, I had to make a choice. You know, when something happened to dad, was I going to quit lawyering or was I going to downsize farming? Or what was I going to do? Hmm. You know, basically the some neighbors uh, of ours that we uh, are really uh, in tight with, we kind of teamed up with them. They started farming the ground and uh, we downsized. And then I actually moved, um, my wife's county uh, is where I'm at now, is about two hours from my home county. I actually moved down to her county, bought a couple hundred acres, 
and uh, I farm that now. Mm-hmm. So I've actually downsized because I just I just couldn't do it all. Yeah. I couldn't do it all. And when my parents are gone, I have no family left in you know because my dad being from Germany and I'll, I have no family up in the county that I grew up in, mm-hmm. where my wife down here in Cass County, Indiana, which is an hour straight up from Indianapolis, a lot more family members. And, um, you know, when it comes to having children, it's nice to have a village for sure. <laughs> you know, And so, yeah, I downsize and I, I don't miss farming 4,000 acres. When you start farming a certain amount of acres, I don't think you're really a farmer anymore. You're a people manager. You know, this fall I ran a combine. This first time I ran a combine in probably six, seven years because the hired men up north, uh, I called up north where my home was, they always ran it. Yeah. Sorry, I'm giving you a long answer to a short question, but I've actually downsized it be so I could focus more on the office because I, I felt that's where I really needed to be. You mentioned, and by the way, that was not in any way long-winded. I appreciate the education. The one thing you, you mentioned in that story is the topic of labor, and it's something you didn't mention before in ag law. How involved are you in employment law issues and maybe even immigration issues with the clients that you counsel? None. By choice? Yes. Those are two what I would call, I use the term specialized areas, in my opinion. Employment law, labor law. I don't do labor law, employment law, workers' comp, probably other areas that I'm, I don't necessarily do bankruptcy. You can only cover so much. And ag law cuts such a wide swath. You know, these aren't narrow businesses. These are businesses that are going to have environmental and labor and contracts. I mean, it just goes on and on. Hmm. And um, years ago, I said, I better pick the areas that I want to do and what I'm good at. And if someone calls me with a labor law or immigration issue, hey, guess what? I've got friends that are attorneys that do that stuff. I'll give you their contact information. You've stayed in your lane. Yes. What do you think most people get wrong about the business of operating a farm? You know, I talked in my intro about this romanticized view or maybe an uninformed view that most people have about farming. Educate us. What what are the things that we non-farmers get wrong? It's interesting you said what you said because I say that all the time. We tend to romanticize farming. You know, well, here's this pretty field and you got the nice cows out there and everything. No, it's damn hard work. Hmm. Okay. It's risky as hell. I mean, anytime you're putting your livelihood at stake on the weather, you're either nuts or, you know, there's always a joke. Is it a mental condition or a disease? (laughs) You know, And the farmers, we always joke about that. And people always say, you know, well, you know, it's the biggest form of gambling they're out there because most time your far- farmer puts way more money in a field than what he d- would go into the craps table in Vegas, right? And uh, Mother Nature as the house can be pretty unforgiving. So I think the risk, the risk and the amount of capital that it takes, I think people have no idea. You know, farming is asset high, cash return low. Totally opposite of maybe a law office, a dentist's office, a doctor's office, you know, professionals where, you know, you got a desk and a computer and some other stuff and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, farming, it's nothing for an average farmer to have, you know, four or five million dollars in assets. It got a little bit better the last couple of years with the inflation and kind of the Ukraine war. Grain prices went up. It was pretty tough from 2013 to about 2020. Mm-hmm. I mean, prices were in the doldrums. And I asked my lender at the time, I said, what do you see the return on investment for farming right now? He said, about 0.3%, not 3%, 0.3%, okay? A little better now, but very cyclical. Prices have been up for a couple of years now, and it's it's time that more than likely we're going to be headed back down. So I think people romanticize it, yes. And if they really looked at the the risk that the farmer takes, I, I think they'd be shocked. I mean, a lot of times you're one bad year from biting the dust. You know, you have a huge crop failure, especially if you don't have crop insurance, you're toast. I think that's what people really get wrong. So similar question. What are the biggest or most significant business and legal issues facing farmers today? Well, I think number one, if you if you ask me, I would tell you that statistics show about 85 percent of farms are not set up as a legal entity. Okay? They're not an LLC. They're not a corporation. 
They're basically a sole proprietor. On the flip side of that, about 86% of non-farm businesses are set up. So why is it that, you know, 86% of non-farm businesses have a, a structure, have protection, minimize risk, minimize liability to the owners, and farmers are, are opposite? Good question. I'm 18 years into this job, and I'm still trying to figure it out, okay? My biggest thing is, if there's any group of people that really despise paperwork, it's farmers, mm. okay? Two words will send a farmer running for the door, taxes and paperwork. And so you have so many farms out there that they're one semi truck away, accident away. They're one spilling fertilizer into a ditch and it goes into a pond and kills fish or, you know, a lake. They're one bad thing away from losing everything. These lawsuits we see now, you know, it used to be had a million dollars in liability coverage. Yeah, you're okay. Now, you can't afford enough insurance. There's $10, $15 million lawsuits against farms. If I'm just John Schwartz, the farmer out there, hey, I'm John Schwartz, the farmer, and I get sued and all my personal assets are at stake, yeah. I can lose everything. Yeah. And I wish it was getting better. I know more farms are getting set up as LLCs. And I think a lot of it, too, is people look at it as a corporate form. What's a corporate form? If me and my wife set up a corporation to run our family farm or operate as, am I a corporate farm? Hmm. I don't think so. But got a really bad stigmatism to it, that name. I think a lot of farmers, you know, felt like, well, if I set up an LLC, I'm going to be, you know, I'm, I'm a corporate farm. So I see that a lot. There's way too much risks that the farmers could get rid of and they're not. And number two, the succession planning. You know, supposedly... Well over half the farms in this country do not have a succession plan. And that stems from people don't like to talk about dying. Mm -hmm. People don't want to give up control. People may, you know, they're all hung up on what's fair. Okay, I got John farming and we've got two other kids. They don't farm. What's fair? How much should he get and all that? And the taxes and the, the ramifications from that will just, I mean, it'll destroy a farm. Does the graying of the industry impact that as well, that there's nobody to pass the farm to? There's nobody that's interested within the family, at least? Yeah, that is part of it. The USDA came out and said in this decade, 500,000 of the 2 million farmers were going to be gone, either dead or retired. But don't worry, there were 380,000 people that were going to step in and take over those farms. Well, that's batting well over, I mean, you're by 60, 70%. I can't tell you in my experience with probably over a thousand ag clients if I see that, okay? But who might argue with the USDA? I think if half the farms out there have somebody to take over, that's a strong number. What I would like to see is I would like to see, and, and I, I started talking to clients, hey, you don't have a family member, but how would you feel if you got a non-family member to take over? Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, the, the farm is what, the, you're not the farm and the farm's not you, is why I tell clients, you know. And at the end of the day, you've worked and you've built this farm up. Do you want to see that farm continue? Well, nobody's ever told me no. Okay. And is it okay if that's a non-family member? And people are kind of warming up to that. I'd like to see Congress change some laws where, okay, if you did do that, if John Schwartz, if my three boys don't want to farm and I want to bring a non-relative farmer in, well, maybe if I sell him my land, I don't have to pay capital gains. Maybe if I sell him my machinery, I don't have to pay uh, depreciation recapture. Maybe um, we can value it different, so on and so forth. I'm aware of two groups in the country that kind of do a matchmaking where someone trying to get, wanting to get out of farming, kind of get in. But again, taxes motivate people. And so I'd, I'd really like to see Congress, and in all my spare time, I'm going to try to reach out to some of the senators out there and, and start broaching this idea of like, hey, why can't we change some tax laws to, if you are going to bring this in, these non-farm people in, give the farmer a break. Hmm. And I looked at my family farm in Germany. Um, my dad had uh, three second cousins that, that never married, and the person that is inheriting the farm is not a Schwarz. Uh, he's got a different last name. And I was thinking on that, and that's how this all started. I'm like, I could go see the farm in Germany today if I wanted to. Am I going to care that it's not a Schwarz running it? No, 
he's a distant family member, but at least he's still there, right? And I thought, why can't that be replicated here? Why can't we really start looking at, okay, John Schwartz doesn't have people that, are just, you know, sons or daughters to take over, but hey, there's Jimmy, the neighbor kid down the street. Mm-hmm. He doesn't have the assets uh, or the capital to get into farming. He's going to need a break. So why don't we change some things where, sure, I can sell to Jimmy. I don't pay capital gains. He can buy it at a lower price, so on and so forth. That's the major, the, the biggest problem, I really think, is the lack of financial ability for people to break into farming. To state the obvious, at the heart of any farming operation is the land. What impact is the cost of real estate, urban sprawl, and also wind and solar needs and expansion that way. How is that affecting farming? Well, the last time I saw land prices go down in this country of substance was 1981. I'll never forget, my dad bought a farm for a thousand an acre. The same farm you wouldn't take less than 10,000 an acre now. Uh, Jimmy Carter decided not to sell grain to the Russians, and, uh, and the, the, that was kind of the start of the, the, the 80s farm crisis. Well, actually, it had started before then, sorry. And then getting into the early 80s, things were bad, and then the price dropped. And I remember my dad saying the farm was, he bought it for 1000 it was worth 700 an acre. It was $300 per acre underwater. After that, it's just been, you know, a meteoric rise, as of late even. And I don't know how people buy on at these prices. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, just to speak candidly, the last farm I bought was 8000 an acre, and that was expensive. Well, now we're seeing thirteen, fourteen, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 an acre ground here in Indiana. Sometimes it gets even crazy and gets into the 20s. And I just, uh, you, you can't do it, especially at 8% interest. Good luck mm-hmm. yeah. with the higher interest rates now. So, yeah, it's a huge problem. I mean, The solar farms coming in and leasing, you know, there's less ground for farming as the more solar takes. So that plays a role. Like I said, the interest rates, the cost, I mean, it just goes on and on. It's like the imperfect storm right now. It really is. I mean, if there's ever a time in all my life I can think of, this is the most difficult to buy any ground. Interesting. John, I am grateful for the insights that you've offered and for sharing your story, actually your many stories with us. I appreciate what you do as a lawyer and a farmer, and I thank you for taking the time for what is no doubt a busy day for you. So thanks for being here. I I appreciate you having me on. Um, I really enjoy, I enjoy this job a lot. I do. I enjoy helping people. And I got a list of farms that I've saved. I keep a list. It's nice to be able, some some days when I have a bad day or a tough case, I, I, I get that list out and I look at it. And I always think, you know what, did I make a difference? And I hope when I'm dead and gone, There's at least one person out there that says, you know what? John was a good guy, a good attorney, saved our farm. That's a pretty good scorecard. Yeah, I agree. I feel really blessed that I'm in two professions with the heavy overlap that there is. You know, being a farmer makes me a better attorney. And I think being an attorney makes me a better farmer. And the fact that I'm pretty uniquely situated to help people. um, And that makes me feel good. Well, again, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Hey, listeners, I encourage you to visit StickyLawyers.com to learn more about John and his two professions and better understand the business of farming. You'll learn a lot more about the things we discussed today, and I'd even say that it's required reading, given where we are with farming in this country. Whether you're a first-time listener or a repeat stickler, a longtime Sticky Lawyers fan, I have a request. Please go to wherever you get your podcasts, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, and click the follow button. That way, you'll be sure to get new episodes, but it's also a digital pat on the back for the team at Rain BDM who work tirelessly behind the scenes to put this all together. Compared to them, I have the easy job. Until next time, I'm John Reed, and you've been listening to Sticky Lawyers.